to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life. I believe there were wonders and signs. You're still the same. I believe every word that you said. I believe there were scars in your hands. That your goodness is good without end. You'll never change. I will tell of your wonders, sing of your grace. The God of creation knows you by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. And your mercy is mighty. Age after age, and all generations will bow down in praise. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. I believe you will come in the clouds. I believe you are here even now. In your presence, I know there is power, power to save. Oh, I will tell of your wonders and sing of your grace. The God of creation knows you by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. Your mercy is mighty. Age after age, and all generations will bow down in praise. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. You are, you are, you always will be God. You are, you are. Yes, you always will be God. I will tell of your wonders, sing of your grace. The God of creation knows you by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. Your mercy is mighty. Age after age, and all generations will bow down in praise. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. You are, you are, you always will be God. You are, you are, you are. after age and all generations bow down in praise the Lord is faithful yesterday now and always good morning Sure, we're all enjoying the slightly warmer weather, right? It got uh, freezing there for a little while, a cold snap, and um, it's weird. I felt like I could go outside in a t-shirt now, and uh, that's, that's a nice change of pace. <laughs> you wouldn't think 30 degrees would feel comfortable, but boy, does it after a negative 10 for a week and a half, or however long it was. We don't have too many uh, things this morning. Um, do want to mention, on a personal note, I had a uh, friend I knew from chaplain school, uh, his name is Gerald Anderson, and he is a captain serving on active duty right now, a uh, very good friend of mine, and uh, he was just diagnosed with stage four cancer of some sort, um, so please keep him in your prayers. Uh, don't know how much longer he has, but obviously that is not a good thing, so uh, please keep him in your prayers. Um, also, I uh, want to pray for the omens. Uh, Kayleen's brother, Johnny, uh, had passed away recently, and I, I believe um, that's where they may be at, at, at the moment. So 
uh, keep the omens in your prayers. And a um, little bit of good news. We had our jam last night. Who was at the jam? Did you have fun? Yeah, I was there. I think only Karen and Dave saw me. <laughs> and maybe uh, some other people. But I was uh, hiding in the back for a few minutes. I had to come in and out uh, for family stuff. But um, I, I thought it was great. Uh, looking forward to uh, hopefully the next one. Um, just need to get a little permission from Terry that uh, we didn't uh, completely burn down the church. Uh, oh, I'm getting a thumbs up signal, so that's a good sign. Um, so we're excited. Thank you to the UTEX for, for putting that on and all their work and effort. And um, I know Marv is excited to do our next one and uh, hoping, hoping we can continue to support them as they do that. It was just a fun sit down, stay for as long as you want thing. They had cookies and some other treats. So um, next time we'll have that posted the dates in the coming month and uh, feel free to just stop by if you're interested. Are there any other announcements? I'm just going to reiterate what Zach said about last night. If you weren't there, you completely missed out. Um, it was phenomenal. Um, just from my point of view, being a musician, seeing these musicians from other towns, Colfax, Osceola, Eau Claire, all different ages and youth playing. So um, special thanks to the UTEX. I really hope we can continue this in our church. Um, there was about 50 people there last night. That was not including any of the musicians, which I think there was 12 to 15 while I was there. So next time you hear about this, guys, you do not want to miss that. So thank you. And then I was given a list of other things to share here. So um, don't forget about the Bunko Party that's coming up February 7th. Um, see your bulletin for that. Um, definitely want you there for Bunko and desserts. I'm going for the desserts, so if you don't like Bunko, come for the desserts. And then this Wednesday night is Hour of Power. You guys have heard about it. We have had a really, really good attendance for the last two weeks. Um, everybody that's been coming has been really thrilled about this. Leaving Wednesday night and through the rest of the week, remembering that message and the deep things we're getting out of that. So if you have not attended, you're curious what it's like, this Wednesday night at 6.30, you may wanna come. We're gonna be doing something really different and I'm not gonna go into details because I want you to come and experience this, but we will be offering a sacrifice to God based on the message, so don't miss it. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Yes. Uh, uh, Heather and I have alternated those Wednesday nights, so um, from what we've seen, they've, they've, like Corey said, they are well attended, and um, I'm sure they would love to have you if you're interested. And uh, Corey, the current series has two more weeks, is that right? Okay, and then you're starting immediately after. Um, so if you don't want to jump in the middle of one, that's probably understandable. Um, you can. I'm not, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying, uh, you know, if, if that's what you're waiting for the next thing to start. Uh, that's how that's going to go. Are there any other announcements? Okay, then let's uh, focus our hearts and minds on the Lord as we read. So I've been getting some requests um, from some people about doing a, a few more of the um, older uh, liturgical elements. And uh, I think I'd actually like if we could all read this together, if you'd like to show that on the screen now. This is the uh, Nicene Creed, one of the oldest uh, creeds of the Christian church. This unites um, all the Christian churches together. And so uh, I'm hoping we can read this together for a call to worship. And we read, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, the same essence as the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, 
He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. And with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. Amen. And just a reminder, I know I've said this before and I know someone else here has. Catholic does not mean Roman Catholic. It means universal. It just means the church Catholic as we are with Lutherans and Baptists and so on. That's what that means. So if you have a reservation about saying Catholic because you think Roman Catholic, that's not what that means. And with that, let's rise to greet one another in the name of the Lord.
The Apostle John wrote, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. In the strength of this assurance, let us confess our sins to God, and we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We confess that it is still all too easy for us to sacrifice our convictions for convenience, your standards for status, your principles for promotion, your absolutes for our ambition, our souls for shallow and unsatisfying success. How easily we are seduced by power, prestige, pleasure, or possessions, seduced into violating our integrity or harming our fellowship with you. From earth's fullest bliss, we turn to you again, unfilled, unfulfilled. Forgive us our half-hearted devotion and our double-minded spirit. In the name of him who refused to save himself, we pray. And at this time, I ask we just take this moment of silence. Pass your own sins to the Lord our God. Righteousness comes from God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. By faith, I have a wholehearted trust which the Holy Spirit creates in me by the gospel that God has freely granted, not only to others, but to me also. Forgiveness of sins, eternal righteousness, and salvation. These are gifts of sheer grace granted solely by Christ's merit. Amen. Heidelberg, Q&A number three. Simple, short, sweet, to the point. How do you come to know your misery? Well, the law of God tells me. That's a weird one, right? This gives three scriptures, and sometimes I'll, I'll try to go into the scripture just for a second. Um, first one it gave was Romans 3, simple verse here. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. We've actually been talking about this, uh, Pastor Brian and I with someone, about um, kind of the, the relationship with uh, uh, the adherence of the law and how that works in the life of the Christian. And um, this is a beautiful illustration of what the purpose of the law is to the Christian. It's, it's to point us to sin. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 7, What then shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law... Sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive, and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Well, if Paul says it kills him, then what hope does he have? Well, should be obvious, the answer is Christ. And this actually beautifully ties into today's message. As uh, hopefully you'll see. Um, <clears throat> thank you, as ever. What am I missing here? Oh, that's what I was looking for. Just want to make sure I was on the same page or something. For the tithes and offerings of uh, our congregation, we wouldn't be here without you. And um, we will pray accordingly, as well as for um, our friends in the community and elsewhere. So let's pray. Blessed you are, O God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed you are forever and ever. 
Yours are the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty. Yours are the mercy and patience, the loving kindness, long suffering, and covenant faithfulness. Yours is the kingdom of Lord, and you are exalted its head above all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Prosper these gifts that we have brought you. Bless the service we would render you, that we may be profitable servants, that your kingdom may come, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And Father God, we pray for Chaplain Anderson that um, your peace may be found in his life and the life of his family. That whatever may come to pass does so with the fullest of understanding that you are Lord and you are God. We pray for the omens that they find peace for the loss of Johnny, that um, funeral, the grief, these things become a blessing and celebration of the life of their, their loved one. May his name not be forgotten. We pray for our church, we pray for our community, we pray for our country and the countries abroad, and as ever those in the midst of war and disaster and grief, we pray. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. Once more, let's rise, and this is a throwback to um, the funeral for Ruth uh, Vienendahl. I won't have to cross Jordan alone. I loved hearing this, and so I hope uh, you'll hear my suggestion to Cassie. Let's, let's figure out how to do that one. Actually, as you're all standing, I did want to share a personal word um, about this song. Uh, some of you might know, and if you don't know, you'll know now. Um, my parents have been singing this song for many years at many funeral services, many memorial services. Um, and I have really fond memories, particularly in my teenage years. Um, they seemed to sing it a lot during that phase of my life. And um, it, was, it was a hard season, I think, um, for my parents. Of course, they, they did a good job of, of uh, making sure that we were provided for, that we were cared for. Um, but my, my dad was in seminary. My mom was working a part-time job to support four kids. And uh, I was getting ready for college, and I was stubborn, and I was independent, and I was probably causing them a great deal of stress with uh, the idea that I would be leaving the nest. I'm not sure they were ready for that. Um, but they were always united in their love for each other and in their relationship with God. Um, this song in particular speaks of um, not being alone as we cross over the Jordan or as we enter into eternity. Um, but I also think it speaks to our earthly lives that we're not alone um, if we have the Lord with us. Um, and uh, if you're blessed to have a loved one, such as my parents did, united in marriage, having each other, they're not alone in that earthly sense, too. So um, I just wanted to share that personal connection to this song. When I hear it sung, I think of my parents' voices. And so it's really humbling to be doing it um, here, essentially alone. But I want you all to sing confidently with me. Um, still recovering from my laryngitis. So if you know this, sing along with me. Let's stand together, if you're willing. When I come to the river at ending of day, when the last winds of sorrow have blown, there'll be somebody waiting to show. to 
for singing with me. I didn't realize this when I worked here, but Cassie actually keeps track of every song we play and has like a log. So at the end of uh, last year, I got this email and it was just this huge list like this long and how many times each song was played. She takes meticulous care to, to make sure that things aren't being played too much or or that they're aligned with the service in some way. So I, I really want to kind of touch upon uh, how much work she actually does kind of in the background, even with the uh, limited hours that, uh, that uh, she's asked for. Um, so we really appreciate uh, Cassie's work and hopefully we can add that one to the repertoire. I thought that was a very nice rendition. And uh, if you are ever curious, there's also a Johnny Cash version on, on YouTube. I'm sure you could find that's cool as well. Hear now the word of our Lord from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 17 through 27. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. 
Lord God, may your spirit be with us, instilled in our hearts, so that we may hear your word most efficaciously. Amen. As I've been preaching over the last year, sometimes you may wonder why in my preaching I've uh, glossed over certain aspects of the biblical text we read, thinking something along the lines of, I wonder why pastor didn't touch upon this part of the text or, or the verse. And the answer to that is that you can have five pastors preach the same text independently on the same scripture and come up with five different sermons. Maybe not completely in totally different areas, but they may focus on different aspects. Now, does that mean that each of the sermons has no merit or there's only one? Well, well, maybe, but not necessarily. Uh, you, you can take scripture in different directions. I think we know that. And I tend to emphasize the uh, more theological and spiritual direction of the text for fear of turning it into something that it's not. Um, since often uh, I, I, I kind of lean away from the practical applications of the text sometimes uh, for, for a real fear, a legitimate fear that maybe I'm going to be uh, trying to make the text say something that it isn't. Um, I think I mentioned a, a few weeks ago about people on Instagram who will say, the Lord strengthens me, and they'll have like an arm flexing in the gym, and it's, it, it's, that's not really what it means. It's a practical use of it, sure. Um, but, but there is a danger in over-theologizing as well. Um, sometimes you can get so in-depth and so muddled in the text um, to the point where you're just speaking gibberish to most people. And uh, also there's people that do things like uh, they look at the numbers. It says... Uh, the tomb for four days and Jerusalem being two miles off. And so if we take these numbers and times them, that leads us to knowing when the end times are coming. That's also not a great direction to go, the sort of numerology stuff. In fact, uh, ironically, secular philosophers and historians uh, will, will do that. They'll look at those numbers and say, see, scripture can't have any theological, or I'm sorry, uh, historical significance um, because these numbers actually were uh, uh, significant in some sort of numerological sense of like the numbers four, four were about luck and the numbers eight were this and this was the magic number. Um, so I think you can go a little nutty with that as well. Anyway, that is all to say, uh, don't feel too worried if I don't touch upon exactly what uh, you would thought the text might be saying for fear that maybe I completely misunderstood it. Um, that's probably not the case. Again, it could be because I don't know what you're thinking, um, but I, I just don't want you to, to worry too much about that stuff. So with that said, let's dive into the theological, and then we will approach a uh, practical application of this text. So Christ says, I am the resurrection and the life. Now recall back all the way to the beginning of the Gospel of John at John 1.3. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Again, I know I hammered this point down, but I got to do it again. If Christ is not God and is merely a created being, this verse insists that Christ would have had to create himself. But since that obviously makes no sense, the obvious reading of the text is that Christ, the Logos, made all created things through him. Everything that was created was made through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, whoever believes in me Though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Without Christ, that is, those who are not in him, those people do not have life. Now, what does that mean? To be clear, the soul is immortal. It is immortal. The soul will not die. And not to get too heady into this, but I believe at the moment that Hell and uh, heaven are, are probably empty. Don't worry. I know that's like, whoa, what? What's he talking about? Um, uh, we hear Christ tell the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. He may have been speaking about Abraham's bosom and Sheol. Depends on how you take that part of the text. Uh, some people take it literally and some don't. Uh, so there's a lot to examine and study there. But needless to say, I, I do believe in the traditional and biblical concepts of the immortality of the soul, which upon judgment will either be sent to the lake of fire or to paradise. Um, whether heaven and hell are empty right now uh, is, is not the point. Someday uh, we'll be there, um, ho hopefully in heaven. <laughs> uh, now, 1 Timothy 6.16 says that God alone is immortal, and, and that is, is very true. 
in the sense that it is unique to his character. But people who make this argument, they'll, they'll use this text and they'll say, well, that directly contradicts the idea of the immortality of the soul. The text says that only God, God alone is immortal. Um, but rarely brought up are the heavenly hosts, God's divine counsel, which are indisputably immortal. No one talks about uh, a Satan dying of old age uh, when he fell or any of the angels, the archangel Michael, just getting too old and not being able to carry on. They're immortal as well. But they're, they're not immortal on their own merit. They are, just as our souls are, immortal because they are derived from God. God's essence, he's innately Im immortal. But we are not innately immortal. We are immortal because of the Lord. And it's this immortality that quite in many ways, um, it frightens me. Why does it frighten me? Has anyone heard the story of or read the short story, The Jaunt by Stephen King? Anyone even heard of that? I'm not very surprised. It's, uh, I don't think it's well known. What's interesting to me, though, is, and I'm not super well-versed in Stephen King, but even though it's not well-known, it's probably the most terrifying thing I've ever read in my life. How is that possible? The jaunt is about a time in the future when instant teleportation is invented. The solar system has been colonized as a result, and so people are able to travel freely between other planets. There's a catch, though. If you want to teleport, you have to be put under anesthesia. Because, as scientists have discovered, if you do not do that, you will be awake for millions of years in an endless white void, alone with your thoughts. I want you to ponder that for a second. Close your eyes, and uh, you don't have to close your eyes, but you can. And imagine nothing. You're awake, you don't get to sleep. Millions and millions and millions of years by yourself. Because when people come out of the jaunt, if they were awake or conscious, they either die immediately of a heart attack or they start screaming gibberish and then their hair goes gray and then they just die. That is scary. Immortality is forever. Forever and ever and ever. It doesn't end. That's millions of years, which to immortality... Is, is nothing, it's this, it's a blip. But to us, that would feel like forever, probably. That's probably why they went insane, right? I mean, well, it was real. Thank God it's not. But the thought of immortality frightens me because even the threat of being put into an endless void for millions of years with nothing but my own thoughts, that scares me in a curious and unique way that I don't think anything else does. You ever lie in bed at night and you start to, your thoughts wander because you can't sleep. Sometimes that comes back into my head and I'm like, no, go, get out of my head, get out of my head. I don't want to think about that. It's such a, it's an irrational fear. It's, there's no risk of that happening. But then I start to get theological and then I start to worry. I start thinking about what must it be like to be in hell? Because that's, as some say, eternal conscious torment. You're, you're awake being tormented. Uh, at least that's the term some people use. These are scary thoughts. And similarly, I was uh, conversely on the opposite side of this as well. Uh, there's an old meme, an old, old joke picture. There's a man clearly being offered the gospel in this image, and he has his hand up like this, saying no. He says, no thanks, I'm not interested in eternal life. I've seen enough. Now, I, I actually believe that. I really did. Uh, when the Jehovah's Witnesses came knocking at my door uh, in sunny California, and I was like 23, and I had no idea what to think, um, except uh, none of this sounds right from my limited perspective. Um, they had asked me, well, don't you want to live forever? And I was like, not really. That's kind of scary. Um, this is even before I knew about the John. I was like, I, I no. Um, that, I have no interest in that. But then I developed a more biblical understanding that, that to be with God in paradise is, is this polar opposite of my dread of the infinite whatever that looks like. Um, I would imagine if we knew that killing ourselves would bring us to heaven immediately, we would probably all be doing that. <laughs> I'm glad we don't, but that's probably how wonderful paradise is. 
that it, it's so wonderful, so glorious that, that we would, can't bear to wait to be there. Um, it's not the right attitude to take, but I'm sure it is that wonderful to use that illustration. And Christ says, do you believe this? And I say, like Martha, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. I believe in Christ, and thus is my salvation. I have no fear of the infinite, in a negative sense anyway, maybe in a, a glorified sense, to be with Christ and with the Lord. And then that's when the fear evaporates, and I know that because Christ is Lord, and because of that gift of grace granted to me, that I'm able to, to love Christ, that I'm saved, and I'm safe, and I'm in him. And, and I, I hope the same for you all, that you all could come, if you're not already there, to that understanding. And it's Mary who would answer this that leads us into our practical application, a bit of a change of pace here. I'm sorry, I said Mary. Martha is what I meant. Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Now certainly Martha asked this question out of her faith in Christ. We see she has faith. But were not her intentions here somewhat misplaced? She has faith in Christ and knows that it is Christ who can raise the dead. But in her grief, her frustration, she forgets that ultimately she should rely on Christ's judgment rather than having any expectations that he do what she wants. Lord, if only you'd been with me when I had been in that car accident. So maybe it wouldn't have happened. Lord, maybe if you had been there when I lost my wallet or, or before my spouse had left me, maybe things would have been different. You, you could have prevented it if you had been there. Often, and in, in most people who, who, do in, um, who do service in ministry in prisons or hospitals, uh, they will experience some form of this, and you might even experience this in day-to-day -day life if you're in an avid uh, prayer with people. That when someone is undergoing something like, like my friend with his cancer or um, some other life debilitating or ending issue, a uh, life-ending issue, they, they, they pray for what? They pray for a miracle. God, please, please cure my cancer. But I tend to think this is misplaced. The late great R.C. Sproul once answered the question of, what's the point in praying to a sovereign God? Why would we pray to a God when we know we can't ultimately change his mind? And his answer was, well, that's because that's, that's not what we should be praying for. We shouldn't pray that God changes his mind. We should be praying that God changes our mind. So when I pray as, as tactfully and as gently as I can, uh, when I prayed in these hospital settings especially, I tended to nudge toward an acceptance of the reality that God had handed to us. God, we, we pray for a cure, we pray for hope, but ultimately we rest assured that you are our ultimate peace. And then we pray, even if we don't know your reasons, that, that we have the, the peace and knowledge that to live is to live for Christ, but to do, or to die rather, is gain, that we may be forever with you unto eternity. I couldn't find the infographic I was looking for, but maybe some of you have seen um, this in some past uh, church lessons. Uh, they talk about the, the life cycle of a Christian spirituality. At the very beginning of the start of our faith, we start out as uh, baby Christians and then eventually um, senior saints as we go on through the years. And it's not really about age or, or even time necessarily. Um, I mean, it comes with time, but it's about uh, where, where you're at with the spirit. And, and some people never truly escape the baby stage. If you ask uh, Heather, I'm still there, and leave passed me a while ago. So it just depends on, on who you are or the person who's uh, perceiving you. And sometimes no matter what stage we may be at, because most of these types of uh, concepts aren't concrete, we do slip up, even unknowingly, especially like uh, Martha in times of grief or anger or exceptional emotion. But the most important facet of this is what she says once again. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. 
And ladies and gentlemen, this is the gospel, that Christ will once again return to judge the living and the dead, just as we, we read in the Nicene Creed. And when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray for just that as well. When we speak the words, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Will you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Once again, let's rise to worship our Lord in song.
I give the benediction, two uh, last things I uh, wanted to mention. We get a lot of requests on our calendar um, uh, saying, hey, is this day full? Uh, on our website now, we've changed it so that it's about three months out, I think, is the, is the hope to keep it that way. So if you ever are curious, go on our website um, and uh, you will be able to see the calendar there. Uh, the other thing, um, I'll try to keep this short. We are sending out letters. If you are a younger family, you should have gotten one inviting you to a census. Um, I think the age range was 18 to 41. Um, so if you didn't get one, please let me know. Um, but you are invited on March 3rd for a census thing where, um, uh, census is the wrong word, but the idea is you're coming and you're answering questions that uh, we'll be asking um, on behalf of the consistory, or at least the elders. And uh, we appreciate your time. If you are in a different age range, don't worry, we're not excluding you. We're just doing it at a different uh, date. So expect letters um, in another age range or two in the coming days. Receive now your benediction. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in the days to come. Mm -hmm.